Hello everyone, it's Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore, and welcome to the Music Masterclass. So this is my uh, Thursday session where we talk about making music, and uh, often it's going to be a window into our new Musicianship Skills Workshop, so that you have really specific things to work on to improve your skills, but we'll also just look at whatever other music that you've been working on and that you're interested in talking about. So we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be looking at a variety of things today. All right. So, you know, it's funny. I've never noticed this before, but uh, my Music Masterclass theme has only like four measures at the end of this last system. I should have added some system breaks and stuff to uh, um, make that look more meaningful. But for whatever reason, I uh, seem like I didn't do that. So someday I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, checking in. Hopefully things are going well here and going well for you. Um, so, yeah, I got a bunch of things I want to talk about. And I'm actually going to start with just uh, some music that's been posted to, uh, you know, that's not necessarily relating to anything in particular other than, you know, music that people have been working on. And so one is a, a fugue that Humble New Music has uh, posted. And he's posted it in a couple different versions and asked a couple questions about it. And I want to address those, even though I know he's not going to be present today. Um, it's uh, um, one that he asked for feedback on, and I'm sure he can check this out later. Um, so I'm going to play this fugue at uh, the beginning of it at two different tempos, because he's wondering which one people like better. He got a little bit of feedback on it, but I'm interested in getting more. So here is the fugue at the slower tempo. I will stop it there because I want to just move right on to the slightly faster version. All right. Slightly faster version now. Uh... And I'm going to stop that one there now also. And I am going to now look at them in, uh, in MuseScore. Or it's the same fugue, just two different tempos. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in your uh, thoughts on that. Which did you think was a better tempo? So I'll let you think about that a moment. And then I'm going to make some observations. My answer is going to be different if all I hear is the subject itself, the first, you know, three measures, first two and a half measures, because it's just the eighth notes. Once the sixteenth notes come in, I think it changes my answer. So for me, playing the eighth notes faster was fine, but the sixteenths felt rushed. I mean, that's, you know, 16, can, 16 notes can be fast. It's all personal opinion, personal preference and all, and my preference might be different one day to the next. But here's the thing that you can do, and this is totally legitimate. No one ever said you have to play the whole thing at the same tempo. I swear. Well, I, no, I take it back. Probably your piano teacher told you that when you were seven years old. Um, but it ain't true. It ain't true. You do not have to play the whole piece at the same tempo. And I often make this analogy. Um, analogy. Well, I, the, the analogy is not really an analogy. It's a, it's, a, it's a point. And I will show by uh, reference to uh, Moonlight Sonata, Beethoven, right? Everyone knows that piece. And the thing is, we all perceive it to be this slow, stately thing. I'm just 
just making up how it goes. It's something like that, right? And the thing is, everyone, not everyone, but many people playing that play the first three notes super slow. And then maybe the next three notes super slow. And then maybe pick it up a little bit and then establish a reasonable tempo for the rest of the piece. You establish that it is a slow piece, and then you move to the tempo you really want. That's totally legit. I will say that going in that direction somehow feels better to me, feels more um, uh, okay than starting at a faster tempo to establish that it's fast and then slowing down. Somehow that idea seems a little more wrong. So here's what I would do instead. I would maybe start slowly and then pick it up. get into the tempo I want. By the, as long as all I have are unaccompanied eighth notes, I can play this as romantically as I want. And here by romantic, I mean, you know, actual romantic era. And I know Humble New Music has been talking about, you know, what, well, what's involved in making it sound romantic. And he played it, you know, he had some articulation going on. I can play... Um, so you, once you establish, you know, that it's, it's pushing and pulling, then people don't remember what note, what tempo you actually started at. So start with the slow tempo if you want to establish that it sounds slow, push and pull through those eighth notes, and then once you hit into the sixteenth, the steady stream of sixteenths, maybe that's the time you keep the tempo steadier and decide for sure what it is. So at that point, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, sl the slower tempo was better. But during those first three measures, I'm like, yeah, do whatever you want, is my observation. I'm going to make another observation about this, <clears throat> and that is the theme itself here. I'm not totally clear on, like, often the uh, subjects to uh, his fugues come from other sources. And I was trying to decide, because he mentioned basing something on one of Trevor's pieces that we'll also look at, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. I could be mistaken, and if so, uh, yeah, I'm sure he'll fill me in. But um, what I would observe here is uh, this... What did I just do here? What am I making you think of? What? Anyone have any thoughts about what I just did? I'm playing each note and holding it. What I was doing was pointing out that other than the repeated C at the beginning, there were no repeated notes in there. It was... 11 distinct pitches. No, not 11. 10 distinct pitches. One, and then repeated. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It almost felt like he was trying to write a 12 tone, a tone row, right? A, and so for people who aren't familiar with that, it's a whole uh, style, not even a style of music, an approach to creating music that became popular early 20th century and really kind of dominated most of academia for most of the 20th century. Um, the idea of composing music based on these tone rows, uh, a series of the 12 chromatic pitches arranged in some order. And 
depending on who you talk to and what their personal philosophy is, either it's more important to be mathematically whatever about it, or it's more important to try to make it pleasing musically. Of course, it's important to make it pleasing musically, but as far as choosing the tone row itself, sometimes people might say, no, it's more about the relationships between the intervals and don't try to make it melodic. This is extremely melodic. And he totally could have made it uh, a tone row simply by making that bottom C a C sharp. And now it's 11 pitches. And then had he only added the D sharp, that was the only note that was missing. So one, ooh, how about this? That would have totally done it, right? And I just changed those to sixteenths to kind of echo what I did there. And I did that in part because he's done the same thing over there. So there's a sort of, you know, logic to it, uh, how it all fits together. So anyhow, that idea of creating a piece based on an arrangement of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale um, is a powerful technique. Um, but uh, this, because it is so highly chromatic already, I mean, we're in the key of C, but we're introducing a B flat at a place where, and then a tritone leap, right? This is indicating C7 going to F. The right? That is very strongly implied by that melody. And then feels like it's what in jazz terms we call an enclosure, in classical terms, double appoggiatura, preceding that G with two notes outside the scale. Um, uh, yes, and Bach also wrote a number of fugues that were kind of like this, that exploit the chromatic scale, maybe not explicitly using every note of the chromatic scale exactly once before any is repeated, which is the thing in 12-tone music. Um, but yeah, the idea of really pushing that chromaticism is something Bach really loved to do, Mozart did occasionally, and um, became more common by the Romantic era. So, um, yeah, that was just an observation about the subject itself. The subject itself has some, has some chromaticism in it, some that's really what I would call functional chromaticism, sometimes referred to as essential, and I'm doing the air quotes thing here. Uh, by essential chromaticism, I mean the fact that B flat, E, if this is in fact a C7 chord being implied, well, that B flat is essential. It's part of the chord. And then I call it functional because C7 going to F, that's a secondary dominant. 5 of 4 going to 4. But this guy, after the... That, if assuming it's going back to a 1 chord, maybe it's going, maybe it's going to a 5 chord there. I hear it going to 1 personally. Um, those two notes are not in the chord. They are non-essential. Uh, chromaticism. They're decoration around the melody. They're not essential to the harmony. The B-flat was an essential part of the harmony to create that secondary dominant effect. These two notes are what is called non-essential chromaticism, meaning that they're just there to decorate the melody. Um, now, I said I felt this going to one. There is an awkward thing about this, this subject that I will comment on. Um, it's awkward only in that we're hearing it the way we're hearing it. It's not a bad thing. It's an awkward thing. And sometimes awkward can be good, if that makes sense. It's distinctive is maybe the better word. Um, the, my, my point is we have this steady stream of eighth notes, and then the motion stops for like two and a half beats. That stop of motion for two and a half beats also gives rise to feeling like it's maybe, I won't say it's inherently not Baroque to do that, but it's the sort of thing that you expect much more often. It's a dramatic device. It is definitely more of a romantic device. So as far as that goes, there you go. That's a bit of a romanticism there, but not like Bach didn't have pauses in the middle of some, some of his subjects. I'm quite sure he did. I just 
can't actually think of any at the moment that have such a long pause in them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, um, that is an interesting aspect of it. And then to me, it's, that's like noteworthy and kind of interesting. The place where I said, where I actually think it might be a little awkward is after we get to, well, I'll let MuseScore play it here. Once we've established the 16th notes, this little pause there actually feels awkward. The first pause feels cool. <laughs> the second pause, once the motion has been established, is frankly a little awkward to me. And after that, all the motion is, you know, as steady as I expect it to be. But there was something about the first pause here on that note that felt dramatic and cool. The second pause that happens there on beat two in measure five feels slightly awkward. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way because it's the, um, you know, if, if you know the structure of a fugue, there's imitation, and he's colored the notes nicely so we can follow this. The blue notes there is the subject. The blue notes down in the bottom staff here is what's called the answer, right? It's the same melody transposed, right? Same notes transposed um, into uh, the key of the five, into the key of G. And, uh, but what happens, above, so this you don't mess with. You can mess with a little bit for particular reasons, but tonal reasons, like to make it fit the harmony a little better. You can make certain adjustments to that answer, and that's something I discussed in my counterpoint course at some length, the types of adjustments you make to your answer. But um, uh, this, um, uh, the, the thing that's going on in the top voice, it's what's called the counter subject. And it's free. You, you can do whatever you want. So there's no real reason he had a hang on that F sharp for a whole beat. He could have made it be, doo -dum. well, he could have done this. Right? Could have done that. And uh, The question is, is that really the best answer? I think not. Um, so I'm getting a little deep into this, but that, that's actually cool. It's good to do this. Um, what happens here is um, I feel like harmonically that D chord that I'm hearing is what I want to hear. And then the G on the beat feels off to me. I feel like maybe that F sharp, remember, originally was a longer note. Maybe the answer is I don't want to hear the F sharp until the downbeat there. And here, maybe I want this guy. I want so that I hear the F sharp on the beat. This might make me happier. Ah, ha, 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 yeah. So that, to me, is what I would have done in that measure to not have that awkward little pause there. And again, I'm calling it awkward, but you know, one person's awkward is another person's awesome. So, so um, if the goal was to have a pause, you achieved it. If the goal was, if, if that was an accident, then I would say, listen to it now that I pointed out and decide if you actually like it or if you like my adjustment better. But I actually like my adjustment better. Yeah, so um, that to me is kind of an improvement. Um, and I am going to just play the rest of the fugue down because I just want to make one other observation about it. The fact that the, that chromaticism is built into, oh, so not only is this bit of chromaticism, that secondary dominant, five of four going to four, and not only is there that chromaticism, the uh, um, non-essential double appoggiatura around the G, there is also this bit of chromaticism in that the end of the subject actually modulates to G. And this has come up as, a, as an issue uh, or as a comment, a discussion uh, Humble and Music has had where he's uh, thinking that when the answer comes in, the fact that it's transposed to be in G means you're really supposed to modulate to the key of G. That's not actually how fugues work normally. Normally, 
when you bring in that answering phrase, you don't do it in the key of G. You bring in the answering mm. phrase transposed a fifth, a fifth above or a fourth below, but you cleverly arrange it so it still feels like you're in the key of C for a little while. And then you let it be in G. So that's the normal thing. You transpose you transpose it, but you make the tonal adjustments to keep it in the key of C for at least a little while. But there is a certain type of, of subject called a transposing subject or a modulating subject in which you actually introduce this secondary dominant so that you actually smoothly modulate to G. So he's right that's a D chord that's a D major chord that's five of five going to five on the downbeat here so he's he's created a subject that actually smoothly modulates into the answer and that's fine Bach did that you know occasionally also there's you know a whole subset of his fugues maybe you know 10 percent of them that are considered modulating subjects um, but between this secondary dominant there between the double appoggiatura here and the modulation at the end, this is a pretty highly chromatic uh, subject. So um, what it means is, yeah, as you develop this into a fugue, it's going to be uh, more, chrom more harmonically rich. It's going to have more chromaticism and very likely more dissonance than a typical uh, Baroque fugue might, even though he's following a lot of Baroque fugue uh, formats and so forth. So now I'm going to play the whole thing down and uh, um, maybe make one or two observations more and move on. All right, it's a really nice little fugue there. Um, but can you see what I'm what I'm saying there? It, it's not only because of the chromaticism in the subject, but it's it, it it goes through periods of like, oh, this isn't dissonant at all. This is all nice. That's all perfectly ordinary sounding, but immediately after that. Now it gets much more chromatic, much more dissonant, in part because of the need to keep that subject the way it is. And here, if this were Bach working on that, he would have made either chromatic adjustments to the the subject when it re-entered so that it could be uh, more tonally pleasing, or would have just written different uh, counter material against it to make it make harmonically sense. And he would have had a plan for that right from the beginning. And that's uh, part of the thing is if you're going to write a chromatic subject like this that you plan to develop, you probably want to have a plan for how it's going to go harmonically or you're going to you know, run into dissonances that you don't know how to solve. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Dave, about the grace note at the end. That felt awkward to me, actually. Do -do -do -da -bum, ba -da -bum. Right, that should have been more of an appoggiatura than a uh, than a grace note uh, or an acciaccatura. It should have been an appoggiatura. And for people who don't know the difference, let me open the palette. Oops, open palette. Um, and on the grace notes palette, which is here, the ones without the stem, those are appoggiaturas. And the ones, I mean, w with the slash, without the slash. So if I make it an appoggiatura, 
and then make it a D. And, well, let me just play this. By default, MuseScore is going to play it exactly half the duration, which is typically how you do appositores, but not always. So realistically, I would have just, if you really wanted it to be quarter note, actually eighth note is what I wanted, do, but so I would have just notated that rather than trying to, no, in other words, I would have just actually written in an eighth note, <laughs> not a grace note at all, not an appositora, not an achicatora, but actually written out specifically the rhythm that I wanted because, um, so this, but this is the correct interpretation of appositoras. When you use an appositora, it's supposed to take half the value, but a human performer would listen to it and go, no, that sounds stupid. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to, I'm going to fix the mistake the editor made, but that's an editorial mistake to write it literally as an appositor. Now what you could do is call it a half note and then tie it um, to another half note. You could do this and then human performers and muse score will probably make sense out of it. Right? Or maybe call this a quarter note tied to a dotted half. That would be acceptable also. But again, this, this doesn't look better than just writing the dang thing out. So I probably would have just written the dang thing out um, without the appositora and written and just written this. And now it's perfectly clear. That to me is the clearer way to write it. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't try to abuse ornaments to be something other than their normal meaning and hope people figure it out. I, I would just write out the specific thing you want. So, um, so yeah, there's any number of dissonances in here that, like, you know, that are pretty harsh, actually, like this guy right here. Yeah. Um, individually, that's extremely harsh. And then the C that gets added also. I mean, these are notes that would never normally be heard against each other at all in, you know, Baroque music and classical music, or frankly, even in romantic music. This is what's making it feel actually more like a 12 tone piece is the dissonances like that. And so they really stand out when they happen. If the whole piece had been that way, then that particular dissonance wouldn't have stood out. It just the whole piece would have been a little dissonant. And then you would have, you know, accepted it at that level. But as it is, those moments of dissonance really stand out and you'll have to decide, are those the dissonances I really want? Are those the places I want to stand out? And is that the way? There's other places where there's really nice use of sort of conventional harmony that is, you know, rich like this. This little passage. Anyone know what that is? This guy right here, let me um, highlight the notes. There's two answers here that I will fish for. Um, this chord right here is what I'm talking about, the D against the F sharp and the A flat. If it was just the D and the F sharp, I would say, hey, that's a secondary dominant, right? That's a D. That's a D seven going to G. Um, Warren sang sharp nine. Sharp nine on if it was a D seven chord with a sharp nine, that would be uh, E sharp or F natural. So it's not that. Um, I don't think it's any type of sharp nine chord, but it is an alteration. If we look at it as D seven with a flat five, that would be one way of looking at it. It's D7 with a flat five, but there's a more classically oriented way of analyzing that chord. And that is going to come out if I leave out the F sharp. If I leave out the F sharp, this chord, C and D against A flat, that is this chord here. C, it's a C and a D and an A flat. If I rearrange those with D on the bottom, this is a, a D half diminished chord. So it's, you know, the two chord in minor key. It's, it's a half diminished two chord. By also adding the F sharp to this, it's 
because that chord would normally have an F natural. And we do have an F natural just half a beat earlier. This is called an augmented sixth chord because the interval between A flat and F sharp is an augmented sixth. Spelled that way, and that's the proper way to spell it. Because voice leading wise, what's happening here is F moving up to F sharp, then to G. He has it kind of distributed between voices, which is, you know, not kosher, you know, as far as normal voice leading rules go and so forth, but whatever, you do what you want. Um, normally, though, to get the augmented sixth sound to really do for you what it was designed to do, you'd have that F to F sharp to G in the same voice. But we still get to hear it just distributed a little differently. And normally it's in first inversion, or normally the A flat would be the bass note. And we'd hear that. A flat against F, and then A flat against F sharp, then going to G. So that is what's called the augmented sixth chord. And the presence of the D in that it, it makes it what's called the French augmented sixth chord. And this is all stuff I talk about in my harmony, harmony and chord progression, of course. This is French augmented sixth, is the uh, technical classical term for it. A jazz musician would look at that and say, hey, that's an A-flat-7 chord with a sharp 11. It's a tritone substitution for D7 with a flat 5. And so tritone substitution is another legitimate answer to what that thing is there. So anyhow, uh, I, yeah, I wanted to talk about that piece because it was, a, you know, kind of a lot to talk about and a lot of concepts that are, you know, kind of interesting to talk about independently of some of the other things that we've been working on. I'm going to flip over to another uh, piece that was uh, submitted just because there's a slim chance that there's a relationship here that I'm not aware of. And this is one of Trevor's uh, preludes that's a pretty, you know, uh, well, by Trevor's standards, a fairly short one. So we're going to just hear uh, this prelude here. And let me make sure it's got the uh, audio sources. We're going to pick his YouTube video version. Um, so we'll hear him playing.
Yeah, beautiful job. Um, so yes, the uh, video and the audio are out of sync, but not <laughs> because of the live stream. That's how they are on my computer here too. MuseScore.com seems to have it off. So either MuseScore.com is messing up or Trevor, when you created your video score, you didn't do the thing that you're supposed to do of synchronizing every measure where you press the button to tell it when to move on to the next measure. So either you didn't get that, either you didn't do that at all, or you didn't do it right, or MuseScore.com messed it up somehow. Can't tell you which. But but it is possible to get uh, MuseScore.com to synchronize, you know, to, to tell it when it's time to move on if you're going to play rubato like that. So absolutely gorgeous piece. And um, I'm not going to, uh, is, Trevor, are you here? It looks like... Um, no, I know usually he can't make it to these things, and that's fine. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth in this, but I, I, I did want to at least talk about it with respect to a couple of things. And the couple of things that interested me about it is, well, first of all, was, was that line in there? Because I wasn't sure if Humble New Music had taken this from this piece. Well, I didn't hear that line specifically borrowed from here, right? However... There are a couple of things going on, uh, like, you know, things that are happening in the uh, descending chromaticism here in some of these lines that is vaguely reminiscent of Humble New Music's piece, but I think that's more, at, or for that matter, even the melody itself. this descending line that involves some chromaticism. So there is some of that, and there's these little, you know, other bits of chromaticism that we're seeing here. So he definitely has that descending chromatic line built into this piece quite a bit. And, you know, if you're looking at my facial expressions during the, this thing, it's because, you know, there's a number of things that come as pleasant musical surprises even if you've heard the piece before, when it happens, it's such a welcome ray of sunlight. And so let me point out what I mean by this, um, because now I'm going to work my way back to the Beatles, actually. Um, the uh, chromaticism that I've mentioned here is mostly of the form, uh, we have a descending line, and we are flatting a scale degree, right? Um, so we're in the key of B flat. Then, this is A flat, is flatter than the key. The key has two flats. A flat comes from the key of E flat, which has three flats, right? So it's flattening of things. And the same is true when we look at like other measures, like going into between five and six. Now, this A flat, again, from a flatter key, and he's calling this F sharp, but this isn't really the correct spelling of that. This is really a G flat, um, and normally what happens is when you have a descending chromatic line, you spell with flats. An ascending line, you spell with sharps. The exception is if it's essential chromaticism, a note that actually needs to be spelled a particular way because of the key, but that's not the case here. This is, first of all, it's a descending line. That's one reason to possibly spell it G-flat. But also, harmonically, this chord here is an E-flat minor sixth chord going to five. This is minor four going to five. And you know how much I like minor four. I don't want it misspelled. I want to see the G-flat. And then I recognize, just looking at it, it's going to be a minor four chord. So in any case, almost all the chromaticism has been of this darkening form. The A-flat that we see in a couple places, that comes from the key of E-flat, a flatter key than B-flat. This G-flat comes from the key of B-flat minor. It's, e flat, it's an E-flat minor chord, the minor four chord, which is borrowed from the, uh, the key of B-flat minor, a flatter key than B-flat major. So there's a, a, a whole tendency of the accidentals to darken things. And there's a couple exceptions. There's the E natural here. So this E natural here is a little brief, 
brightening. But if we think about what's actually brightening here, this is basically creating a C chord, a C major chord, a C7 chord. That's five of five. That's the least bright. I mean, this E natural is, um, it's only erasing one of the flats from the key signature, if you think of it that way. So it's only one notch, one tick uh, sharper on the circle of fifths. The B natural that appears here is the brightest note we've had in the entire piece. And it's like this ray of sunshine when it happened. We haven't had that brightness because that's now erasing not just the E flat from the key, but the B flat from the key. And we barely even had any E naturals. And now suddenly we finally have a B natural. And it's this huge ray of sunshine here. So subtle harmonic details like this matter. And Dan, I'm not ignoring your question. I, I wanted to not interrupt my train of thought there. Um, so in any case, uh, yeah, some really beautiful development of things and really beautiful manipulation of these harmonic details. Also, a uh, really interesting use of Italian terms that I don't know. Con parezza. I have no idea what parezza is. Um, lunga. I assume that's long. Um, so <laughs> for me personally, I'm not uh, uh, semplice, semplice con affetto. Uh, with affection? Yeah, so... Um, Back 100, 200 years ago, you could write almost anything you wanted in Italian and expect that most of the people playing the music would understand because people were m mostly, uh, you know, multicultural enough to be able to do that. These days, the number of people who can understand uh, relatively obscure expressions in music is relatively small. Uh, you're usually, I think, better off writing in English. Uh, it's a more well understood language worldwide than Italian is these days. Um, of course, I'm biased as a native English speaker, but I actually think this is a general tendency in published music. Use Italian for allegro, all the traditional Italian phrases, but when it's time to put in anything at all out of the ordinary, either write in your own native language or write in English for maximum. Uh, maximum understandability. All right, so now Dan's question is a really good one about time signature changes. Um, because I don't have an answer for you. Uh, he felt it, is about all I can say. He felt like it needed these uh, couple extra beats in those couple of measures. Um, but I wondered about certain things, like, uh, let me play the ending again here. Oh, it's going to play it. It's, it's not playing the right place, right, because of that whole mismatch thing. So I'm not going to do it. I'll have to do it myself. Is this, is that chord at the beginning of the measure really the downbeat? Or is the F7 chord that it finally arrives on. Is that the downbeat? In other words, was this previous measure? One, two, two. So one and a two, three, four, one, right? Maybe this was a 12-4 measure also. I mean, a 12-8 measure, four big beats. I might have notated it that way to get the F7 chord on beat one. I, I, don't, I don't know that for a fact, but these are the decisions that you ask yourself. These are the questions you ask yourself to try to decide that. And same with that chord that I talked about, the, the brightness of that chord when it shows up. Is that chord there the downbeat of that measure? Is this really, instead of one and a two, maybe it's really four and a one i don't know but you, you listen to it and you just sort of ask yourself how you feel this and so there were several places in the piece where i kind of had that same question for myself um so uh you know about uh um, where the where the downbeat was, what the time signature actually was, and why it changed in some places, but not in others that felt like maybe they could have. So these are these are all subjective questions, and and I would go ahead and post find find where um, Trevor posted that 
uh, on uh, um, on the community and just go. It was in the share and discuss space and just comment on it and ask him and uh, see what kind of answer he gives. Okay, so and yes, uh, purezza I assume has something to do with pureness because you know there are a lot of languages with Latin roots. You can guess meanings of words, but sometimes you're wrong also, right? Um, okay, so I said I was going to tie this back to the Beatles. The way I'm going to tie it is the answer to the question that I um, posed in my um, newsletter. You know, in uh, what we were doing with "You Won't See Me." We had the following. We had this. We had, um, let me jump over to where the uh, harmony parts all are. We have this. I'm starting right here. Their rhythms aren't exactly as square as that, and that top A is probably tied over the bar, but whatever. This gives us the idea. You see that chromatic descending line, right? And I talked about that, those of you in the Musicianship Skills Workshop. That was kind of the focus of my lesson for this week. And when I mentioned that um, uh, Chicago song, that Chicago song, uh, was it in the key? Well, I'll put it in D. It was ba. It went like um ba. And then the trumpets come in. Ba. It's the same. It's the exact same thing that the Beatles are doing. It's the exact same notes, except instead of having two people sing them, it's a trumpet or a brass section. I think it's, I can't remember now, was it trumpet and trombone together or was it just trum trumpet? But it might have been two trumpets overdubbed. Um, um, that's called a compound line. It's technically two voices, but being played by one instrument, jumping back and forth. Which humble new music has a great example of a compound line also in his um, fugue. We have bum, the C, and then bum, and then. And then we have that's one voice. And we have this other voice going, uh huh, uh huh, or oh yeah, or uh uh, or whatever, amen. Uh, this idea of two voices kind of alternating like that in a call and response pattern. It's it's really all over a lot of types of music, but especially popular music of the last hundred years, um, coming really from uh, church music. Not like church music like Martin Luther, but like, um, you know, the gospel church, black, Negro, American, spiritual, 19th century stuff. Um, the preacher and the congregation, preacher saying something, congregation amening and all that. That's a whole, gave rise to a whole genre of music um, where jazz comes from, where funk and blues and uh, pop and rock all kind of get a lot of their information from is that type of uh, setting. So this idea of is also what's called a compound line. You've got two voices and you got some call and you got some back and forth allowing one instrument to do that call and response instead of needing two instruments to do it. So um, so anyhow, that's the connection between those two pieces. Um, and then uh, I wanted to uh, look at Nowhere Man because this was the piece that I asked people to, yeah, work songs is the other part of this tradition. That's what informed the church, right? And so, or the, you know, the combination of blues and gospel, which were like 
you know, oh, devil music, church music, and somehow the same thing. Um, so yeah, this the, the the whole history of that is pretty fascinating. But what I want to do here is take a look at the people who did transcribe Nowhere Man. So first of all, this is Graham's score, which I looked at before. I may have even downloaded, but it's no longer available due to copyright claims. So remember what I said? Well, again, if you're in the Musicianship Skills Workshop, you saw the note that says, yeah, I did these videos thinking that YouTube was just going to put up a little ad like it usually does if you use copyrighted music. It'll just put an ad there so the Beatles get their money. But actually, no, the Beatles publisher... Uh, does had does not have a, a license agreement with YouTube and does not have a license agreement with MuseScore either. So like you can normally upload pop songs to MuseScore and they will show up. They just won't be downloadable unless you have a pro account so that the copyright owners, excuse me, can be paid. But the Beatles music is not part of that agreement. So you basically can't post Beatles music. So the the workaround for MuseScore.com is make it unlisted. Definitely, if you're going to post Beatles songs, make them unlisted and they will remain available. But if you try to make them public, they're going to get taken down. Just know that. So um, we're going to look at Dean's version of Nowhere Man. Uh, and Dean has the main melody here. And um, I am going to say that, yeah, these are basically the right pitches, and I'm just going to play them here. So right, he's a real, in the right octave for uh, John singing it, was there is, I think, the octave he's singing. He's a real nowhere man, sitting in his nowhere land, singing all his nowhere songs for nobody. Do I have the words right? Something like that, right? And then the same melody, again... Same basic melody, slight rhythmic adjustments to fit the lyric. And that's all, you know, really typical. Um, and I do have, uh, actually, I don't have uh, Dean's version already loaded up. Let me, let me do that. This is Dean's version here. Um, so uh, this by the way, I commented, and this is more an engraving uh, workshop or music score thing. But this rhythm, boom, bum, that was doesn't have a point of view, right? Boom, bum, that syncopation. You don't need the tie here. We talk about when writing eighth notes that we want to group them in beats of four. But when you have that rhythm, bum, 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 that rhythm is more properly written with the quarter note. You only need to break up that syncopation between the first half of the measure and the second half of the measure, between beats two and beats three. You do not need to break up syncopations between beats one and beat two, at least not eighth note syncopations like that. And it doesn't make it easier. It doesn't make it easier to read, especially, I would say, given that there was a repeated note before and after. It just makes it look that much more cluttered, right? We have the, re we have the repeated B before, and then we have the E, tied over after. Um, it just makes it look that much more cluttered. So you definitely want to just have the quarter note there. Um, but aside from that, yeah, it's totally the right rhythm. And then we get to the bridge. Nowhere man, starting in bar 16. Nowhere man, please listen. You don't know what you're missing. Da -da -dum. The world is at your command. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, is that the right lyric? Something like that. Um, uh, so, yeah, absolutely, you got the right notes there. So for anyone who is doing this and wants to check your work, check it against Dean's. He's got absolutely the right notes. Rhythmically, they're close enough because, yeah, the um, uh, the actual rhythms are, you know, loose is my best word for it. They are um, not straight on the beat or even exactly off the beat when they're eighth notes. It's a little push, a little pull, some little anticipation, some notes a little laid back. Um, so to me, it's not worth obsessing about those details. You just want to get the rhythms essentially readable. And so writing four quarter notes is fine, even if they're not quite exactly that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely nailed it here. Um, now, I also talked about wanting to maybe try the uh, ah la la la. So, no women, please listen. 
what happens the background parts here is and that's the top note or bottom part is that's what actually happens in the background parts I don't think I've seen anyone try to notate those yet um, but I'm gonna talk about harmony parts uh, in either next week or the week after but what's going on here as someone I'm surprised I don't see someone pointing anything out about this in the chat what's going on here This sound in those background parts. So I know the chat's a little behind. We'll see if someone manages to say it before I am about to say it, but I'll say it right now. Those are parallel fifths. <laughs> right? Perfect fifth, perfect fifth. And the question is how bad is that? We learn taking music theory. Yeah, okay, now everyone's saying it, yeah. Okay, um, so um, we learn when you study music theory and voice leading and so forth that parallel fifths are bad. And in my counterpoint course, I give examples of parallel fifths and talk about how, well, bad is not really the right word. It's, it's more, well, it's not the sound that composers were going for, but sometimes it is the sound <laughs> that you're going for. And so I gave examples in the counterpoint course about Bartok very deliberately, using them in the left-hand part of, of some piece, because Bartok wanted that sound. Now, I'm not going to go so far as... And, and then I often use the example of rock guitar players and what are called power chords, and usually they're done with some amount of distortion. Bang! Right? Bang! Where you just basically make a pair, you make a, a perfect fifth shape on the guitar, and then you slide it up and down the neck just on those two strings, and they're called power chords. You do them distorted, and it's the basis of a lot of rock. And um, usually, I give as an example of of that type of thing happening. I give as an example, I want to hold your hand. And I don't know if that's actually literally true, but I'm not going to ruin the uh, copyright status of this video by listening to the Beatles, I want to hold your hand. But I kind of think that there might be somewhere, it might just be, it, it, it might just be one of the two, it might just be the, the, the fifth on top. I, I Now I got to listen to it to be sure. But in my mind, <laughs> the beginning is that's something whatever um in my mind it's parallel it's power chord fifths like that but without the distortion um i i will want to verify that later because it probably isn't um but in any case the thing is uh it takes effort to avoid parallel fifths and so one of the things you learn about in music theory is how to use contrary motion so that if you want to go from so that we're in the key of E for nowhere man and we're going from a three chord to a four chord. Well, first of all, three chords are barely a thing in classical music. They'll say, no, don't use a three chord, it's really a one chord. It's really, it's not this at all, it's this. It's the one chord in first inversion. In most classical music, they don't use the three chord much. It's really the one chord in first inversion and maybe it's has a passing tone where you momentarily hear something that sounds like the three chord. It's not that the three chord can't be used in classical music, but one of the reasons it isn't, because if you want to go to four, you're going to have that parallel fifths problem to solve. So if instead you do this and have one in first inversion, that solves it. Now you have what's called oblique motion. Instead of parallel motion, one voice is staying the same. So nowhere man. been okay. And that's how Haydn would have done that if he were to have written Nowhere Man. But 
yeah, there's nothing wrong with a three chord. And, but if you do want to connect the three chord to the four chord, you're going to get those parallel fifths every time, just like you will if you try to connect the four chord to the five chord in root position. You're going to get parallel fifths unless you try to do some contrary motion. Have these voices. So instead of doing this, maybe I'll voice it like this. Spread those three notes out some, and then instead of having both of these go up, I'll let this one go down. I don't know why I've revoiced it. I can totally do it here. I could have had or ah sorry, um, and avoided the parallelism by using contrary motion. This requires some knowledge of the rule and planning. And what we're going to see as we explore this music further is that a lot of what goes on in vocal harmony and pop music isn't based on that kind of pre-planning. It's based on the ear and based on parallel motion, or at least similar motion, moving everyone in, con in similar motion, the same direction, going up at the same time, going down at the same time. And um, it's... Um, it's something you can do by ear, and your ear is going to help you find notes that fit the chord. Your ear isn't going to object to those, par par to those parallel fifths. Your ear is going to say, you know what, that's fine, and it's not going to have a problem. And so this is a good lesson in how important parallel fifths are or not are um, to avoid. If your ear doesn't, if, if the people doing these harmonies working them out by ear aren't being bothered by them, maybe you shouldn't either. And in this style, it's, it ends up being part of the style, part of the rawness. And yes, uh, there's what's called a regression when you move the harmonies in opposite directions from how they usually go, like four to five. If instead you go five to four, um, you know, that's uh, regression, regression harmony also. So, um, in any case, I've talked about all the things that I came here to talk about, and hope you all had a good time and maybe learned a few things along the way. Um, but now I'm going to leave you to continue working on things, and I'll have some more uh, lessons for you taken from the Beatles next week in the Musicianship Skills Workshop. And by all means, just keep, keep doing what you're doing, keep writing music, keep posting it, keep working on the exercises I give you, and uh, we'll just keep learning together. <laughs> So, with that music, that means it's time for uh, me to get going. And uh, um, thanks again to everyone for being here. Thanks to uh, Trevor and Humble the Music for the music that we uh, looked at here. For Dean for the uh, just perfectly uh, perfectly structured uh, version of that melody. I do want to talk about the guitar solo. No one's done the guitar solo yet. Someone notate that guitar solo because I want to talk about the guitar solo next time in Nowhere Man and what it means harmonically. Uh, where it comes from, because, well, one of my favorite chords is in there. All right, everyone, thanks, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>